Please, court. Council. Good afternoon, folks. I'll start out by commenting or making the point that this is my only opportunity to talk to you. The state's going to get up afterwards and have their last argument or statement to you. So we don't get to go back and forth all afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I suspect that not only uh, will the state uh, disagree with some of the things I have to say, but maybe make other points that they believe is, are relevant. So I'm going to try to be as complete as I can because it's my only opportunity. So please bear with me. Um, when we came in here on Monday, and you were picked as our jury, we had opening statements to you. And I went back last night and looked at my notes about that. And what the state, and these are my notes, and I, I think the state would agree with me, we don't try to deliberately mislead you. We're, during these trials, we're scribbling notes and taking down what we later have to rely on. So I'm not going to deliberately try to mislead you, but I believe, to the best of my ability, these are the notes. Amy not happy, prior affair, uh, Todd confronts Jerry and his wife in July. Uh, her denial is not enough for Todd. The affair continues. She makes all these statements to her friends. And then a cold and calculated plan as set forth today. He tried to think of everything, they say. Only people at the farm, Amy and the kids. Get her outside, get her separated. S send her to the shed. Uh, claim that the corn rake is an accidental fall. Go back to the barn where Tristan's at. Send, send Tristan to find her. Act upset. Call 911. Tell them that she fell. Then doctors, lawyers, law enforcement don't buy it. Amy told friends he'll kill me. The iPad searches. Plan to kill. Evidence, evidence overwhelming. I then looked at, at uh, my notes and what I suggested to you when we started this trial. And basically, I, I'm not going to repeat all those steps, but it really was what Todd Mullis told you from the stand yesterday about specifically that day, November 10th, 2018. The morning, going to the other farm, coming back, going to the hog barn, doing the chores out there that they had planned to do. All that, I believe, was consistently presented to you from, from the witness stand. Not only by Todd, but by Tristan, too. The state talks about Tristan that at first he said, I was with Dad all the time. Then it was I was, a, I was not with him for maybe a minute and a half. And then the other day on the video testimony, he said, well, I, do, I don't know. But remember what he and I talked about after he said, I don't know what the time was. I said, okay, what, what did you do when you stepped out of the main part of the hog barn and were not in eye contact with Todd? And you remember what he said? I got a drink of water. And I think I did it twice. Any other absences? Nope. So the time that you were out of eye contact with your dad is the amount of time that it would take two drinks of water out of a hose just a few feet away from the door to the hog barn. Now, you saw photographs, and we'll look at them in a few minutes, of how big that barn is and where the entrances and exits are. So the state would want you to believe, apparently, is that Todd went to the other end of the barn and out a door and ran up the, the length of a football field then on to the red shed, committed a murder, got back before Tristan finished a drink of water. Now, feasible? That's what you have to decide. I 
I believe, if my notes are correct, that I told you at the beginning of this trial, Amy Mullis was murdered. It wasn't an accident. And it, it, it doesn't take much to figure that out when you finally see the extent of her injuries. And I'm going to divert here a bit and try to touch base on some of the state's closing that uh, you just heard. Uh, started out with, Amy is scared of Todd, planning on leaving him. Todd not, is not telling the truth. Well, what the story we've heard is that apparently Amy fessed up to an affair about five years ago. And they went through some counseling. It wasn't easy. But they came to an understanding that she was going to leave the hospital, which was, as you heard, she had a party when she left, not that she was dragged kicking and screaming out of there, that they were going to refocus their life. Amy was going to be a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home farmer. They were going to expand the hog operation to another barn. And that's what they did. And for the next four and a half, five years, Todd had no warnings. He had no signals. He, they were basically living the dream. But Amy, obviously at some point, wandered. The contact that she was having with Jerry Frazier led her into another affair. What's Amy going to tell her friends when they finally find out or she tells them? Well, the reason I'm in an affair is because I'm, I'm afraid of Todd. I'm, I'm not happy with Todd. Amy's justifying her actions. She's telling her friends, he's a bad guy. He, he, he scares me. He's, I'm not happy. What, what are we hearing from everybody else? And sometimes even from her. He's a good guy. He's a hard worker. He's a good dad. So what, what's unhappy for Amy? At the same time, during those four to five years, and as you heard from Terry, she's golfing, she's lunching, she's taking boat trips, uh, she's uh, having fun with friends, she's on the volunteer of the Earlville Fire Department, um, tumbling, going on vacations. So is this a, a prisoner? Is this someone being controlled and dominated by Todd Mullis? I don't know about you, but it doesn't sound like that to me. She tells people, he'll kill me or I'll disappear. She's justifying what she's doing and perhaps even in her own mind. The, and again, this is going to be jumping around here, and I'll try to get back to a more orderly presentation to you. Uh, Carrie Callan, things are pretty tense around here. There was some tenseness around the Mullis house there in the last part of October, first part of November, because Todd's mom got upset because Todd was encountering a tough time. It was bad weather. Field work wasn't getting done. And Amy was spending time with her uncle, who had suffered this brain bleed, which there's nothing wrong with that. But three kids at home, bad weather, crops, and so forth, well, he complained. He complained to his mom. And I think he even complained to Terry about it. And there, his mom said something to her. and. What did Todd do? Todd told his mom, you're out of line. You shouldn't have said that to her.
Then the state says, and again, I'm, I'm jumping, Todd isolated her in the shed that day. No one else there at the farm. Well, we, we talked at the beginning of this trial that we're not here, or at least I'm not here, to try to prove who murdered Amy Mullis. She was murdered, but the question is who? And if you want to speculate, look at the aerial photo of this farm. The main gravel road, main north-south gravel road, runs within a few feet of that shed. It's November 10th. Apparently it was warm enough that the day before, Todd's nephew was doing some field work. But too, too frozen to do that Saturday morning, which is what Todd had planned to do. So was his plan that day to do uh, ripping, or I call it chisel plowing, or was it to kill his wife? Well, going back to this weather issue, the doors to this shed are, are frozen open. They won't close. Is it possible that somebody could have went in that shed and been in there and, and Amy surprised him? I know that sounds like a murder mystery, but could it? Whatever happened in there was sudden and violent. There's comments about he, he uh, puts her in the pickup, uh, he pulls the fork out of her back. Well, you shouldn't have done that. Everybody knows you shouldn't do that when someone has a puncture wound. He couldn't get her out the door with this dang thing sticking out of her body. What a horrible, horrible situation to be in. To lay her on the lap of, her, of his son, to call 911 and drive as fast as he could, trying to get help, telling the 911 operator, I can get closer. No, stop. Let the ambulance come. Now, late this morning, but actually at the very end of Todd's testimony, we hear this repeat of the 911 call. And the words I wrote down that the state says he was saying, he was whispering into the 911 call as he was doing CPR on Amy, was cheating whore and go to hell cheating whore. If you listen carefully, and it may be very difficult with that type of equipment, but if you listen carefully, he's, he's out of breath. He's, he's, he's doing compressions, he says. She's cold. She's cold. And he tells Thompson that as soon as Thompson steps up, she's cold. Who? <laughs> it just boggles the mind that you would be on 911 saying that. If you murdered your wife and you're, you're whispering, cheat your, uh, go to hell, you, you're going to do it on a 911 call? She's not saying that. And if you have trouble hearing it, you're going to have to let the court know. But it's, she's cold, and she, he's panting. <sighs> she's cold. Listen, that is a Hail Mary by the state here, folks. And I'll, I'm going to get back to this a little bit more, but he's criticized because he, he thought it was an accident. And he told everybody at first that's what it was. The Google searches. If you look, and there's, there's a lot of them. Defendants exhibit N always. There's um, 2,945 entries on NO. And some of them are exactly what the state says. Uh, cheating people, Aztecs, and I, 
I don't know all the particular terms. But who's engaged in activity that would make someone think, you know, I wonder what's on the internet about this, other than the person who's cheating. And we don't know how long Amy cheated. Now, we, we, Jerry Fraser said with, her, with him anyway, it was from maybe late May, he thought June of last year. But who, who was the person five years ago that cheated? Amy. Who, who would be concerned about those topics? Now, I know what the state is trying to do. It's, it's like, well, Todd's going to go in there and he's going to search because he's suspicious and he's going to plan, he's going to do these things. I think the other way around makes more sense. And of course, the state has to discount what Tristan says. Doesn't want to lose his dad. He's with said he's with his dad the whole time, and then there's that change of timing that I talked about a few minutes ago. You saw Tristan. Pretty solid kid. And he said the same thing from the get-go. Now, if, if I was to describe yesterday here in this courtroom, if someone says, were you with Christy all day long? I'd say, yeah. Did I go out in the hall and go to the bathroom? Did I go down to the pot machine and get a pot? Sure. But I was with her all day long. That's what Tristan said. I was with him the whole time. Well, he was with him the whole time. They were in the barn together. Were they eyeball to eyeball? A couple times no, apparently. And Tristan told you about that. I'm sure he does feel pressure. But is he not telling the truth? Is he covering for his dad? Did he make that up that quickly? That by the time they got to the, well, he didn't even go to the hospital. He went back with Michael Krogman and told the two deputies what had happened, that they were, him and Todd were in the barn. Amazing for him to come up with that and stick with it Objection. for so long. There's no testimony to his statement at that time, Judge. Go ahead, proceed, Mr. Fireholm. Thank you. Witnesses Thompson and Cruz, uh, the doctors, no problem with those. They did their jobs. They explained things to you. Amy was murdered. Dr. Thompson figured out that it wasn't an accident. He found more holes, and then they started to investigate more, more puncture wounds. The the state goes through, and <clears throat> I'm just too old to try to learn it. I, I don't have a PowerPoint, so just please listen to me as closely as you can. Those elements of malice of forethought and all of those things, you only have to get there if you think Todd did anything. Th those are complicated instructions, and they have all this terminology. If you don't think Todd Mullis committed this act, then you don't have to try to analyze all that stuff. Things with, uh, she mentioned the interview with uh, the DCI agent that was here yesterday. Um, he's trained, he's experienced, and he wouldn't let Todd say a word. He'd ask a question, but he wouldn't let the, wouldn't let him answer. And and his his uh, analysis that well he should have just said I didn't do it. He should have been more emotional about it or whatever. Todd's comment was, "You're asking me to admit to something I didn't do. What what's clearer than that? Especially when you you walk into the room thinking that perhaps this is still an accident." He, and they, they made a big deal out of making that, that clear, that up until that point, until this agent says, we got the facts, we, 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 we might even have some uh, audio of you fighting in the kitchen that morning, we got it out of the cloud, which was a lie. Objection. Go ahead, Mr. Firehome. What, 
what that agent wanted from the get go is he felt he was clever enough to get Todd to admit that he did something and he would have had to get him to admit to something he didn't do and Todd just wasn't going to do it. And you can see how many times he circled around and came back and tried to get him to say it. Todd's criticized by the state for becoming super dad. What the heck else was he going to do when she's gone for almost half the time through September and October? And I'm not criticizing her for being gone for love of family. And some, some tragic, obviously this came up unexpectedly if he had an aneurysm or a brain bleed. Uh, there's no warning on that. But to now say, well, this, this is part of a plan. He was going to be super dad. Um, it, it's, it's grasping. On November 10th, 2018, in Delaware County, Iowa, Amy Mullis was viciously and deliberately murdered. Your job is to listen to the facts, the evidence, look at the exhibits, and decide what? Who did it? Partially, but only the only part that you have to decide is if Todd Mullis did it. Because certainly, she was murdered. The evidence that you've heard, both from the state and from the defendant, is that that morning Todd and Tristan went to the other farm for chores to see if conditions would allow for further field work. They didn't. Back home, a bite to eat. Amy's doing a puzzle. She had had this medical procedure done a few days earlier on the 6th of November. And the plan, which had already been discussed between Todd and Tristan, was to go out to the hog barns and get ready for a delivery of pigs, the small pigs. That they, that was their job, was to raise them up to butcher weight. Amy wants to join. She had been, in, she, Todd says she was in, had been in the house due to that medical procedure, was getting kind of antsy and wanted to do something. So him and Tristan go out she follows. They each take on a task and number J please. There's there's the barn that they went to. That loading chute door in the center and to the very right as you're looking at it is that service door going into the office area. So that's where they went. All right, please. There's that service door that you saw open in, in the first photo, and that's looking out from inside the office. And I believe Todd explained that to, as we're looking at this photo, that window to the right would be looking up towards the house and the shop. The window to the left is looking out into the main part of the hog barns. Would you go to Q, please? We were told that th those are those heaters that Tristan was retrieving from that storage area and hauling out to the pens where they would be installed in anticipation of these small hogs, pigs, piglets, I guess. Triple R, please.
I believe Todd explained that this is looking the other direction from the service door. Now the window on the left is towards the house and the shop. The window on the right is out into the hog barns. And you see straight ahead the door that goes out to where the, the uh, to the left would be the loading chute and to the right would be the door that looks down that long hallway, which we'll see here in a second. X, please. Todd explained that that's the shot looking through that, that window on the uh, south side, I think I got my directions right, of the office, which looks out into that hog area where they were working, getting things ready. T, please. Here you can see kind of a combination. To the right is uh, the office where we've seen the earlier photos, but now you can see down the long walkway to the other end of the barn. Could you go to N, N please? N is in Nancy. There's a good layout of how, just how large this massive building is and that long walk to the far end where there is a, another service door. And it's in there where they're taking these heaters and those nipple pipes that uh, water things that Todd described. And as you can see, light bulbs that Amy was clear cleaning. Standing on a pail sometimes. Or off, off, always. Q, Q, please. If, I believe it's correct that if you would, would have gone the full length of the building, gone out that back service door, and now we're headed back towards the red shed, the shop, that area. That's what you'd see. That's how far you'd have to travel on foot to get up there. The red sh shed is just beyond that, that tree, and by just to the left of the steel um, grain bins. Oh, please. The water hoses in the office where Tristan got a drink of water, just a few feet away from the doorway that we just looked through. W. They look out of the north window of the office area in the barn to the shop, and there's the garage on the end of the house. The area where Todd explained where he expected to see the pet carrier that Amy had gone to retrieve. Last like AA, please. And I believe Todd described this as you'd be standing very close to that service door going into the office and looking over towards the red shed. You can see the opening where the door is now wide open. So that's where we're at, the three of them, each doing their individual chores. 
but at some point both Tristan and Todd observe some unsteadiness on Amy. She's, they, they obviously are aware that she recently had this medical procedure. Uh, Terry Stanner told you about how it was. But she also, remember what Terry said? She went back to work that day. So, if, depending on what Amy's physical health was because of maybe excessive bleeding and so forth that was described, uh, we, we just don't know, she, other than she'd been taking it easy for several days. Todd says to her, take it easy, go to the house. A couple different times, each of, he, he and Tristan observed this unsteadiness. Finally, if you want to help, go get the pet carrier from the shed and put it up by the shop. And we know why. The kittens don't get run over, so forth. And that they had planned to get the, these, uh, a water tank out of there with some motor vehicle, a skid steer or four-wheeler or something. So Todd and Tristan continued to work for an hour, perhaps, maybe longer. And finally, when they looked out that window that I just showed you to, towards the shop, there was no pet care, and Tristan went to see whether she had, couldn't get it out or had gone to the house and just didn't try or whatever. <clears throat> And then the horrible, horrible events are discovered. Um, I've talked about it, you know, getting put in the pickup, the 911 call, how Todd tries to, to see if, she, if she's alive or if she's breathing, responding. She's not. They meet uh, the 911 call we've talked about and that he's not whispering terrible things at the end of it. Todd goes on to the hospital. Tristan goes back to the farm. Tristan tells his story uh, at the hospital, at the school. He's, he's interviewed several times uh, consistently, other than the differences about this time and being eyeball to eyeball. A, a difference that I say is, is not significant here at all. Where did this investigation go off the tracks? I, I would place that point when Todd said in the 911 call, she fell on the fork. At that point in time, he had no other explanation. He, he didn't believe it to be a, a brutal assault. The only thing he could think of, she had been dizzy and she's got a fork in her back she must have fell trying to get this pet carrier out. Now you can second guess and, and Monday morning quarterback that thing, but now we know a lot of more. We know a lot more. She had, had the medical issues. She had the medical procedure four days earlier. She had been taking it easy. She wanted to get out of the house, and, and she had balance issues in the barn. Was it so unreasonable for him in, in that moment of panic on a 911 call when he's being asked? What happened? She fell on this fork, and you can hear it. Was he to assume she had been murdered? What sense would that make? As the state says, it doesn't make sense. And I agree it doesn't make sense. But that doesn't make sense doesn't equate to Todd Mullis being guilty of first degree murder. It was based on what he knew at the moment, at a moment of, of extreme emotional stress. He didn't know there was more than four puncture wounds. You, you saw all the clothes that came off. Even the medical people didn't know it until they really examined her, that there were more than four puncture wounds. He, Todd didn't know that, or Tristan either, really. As soon as the medical professionals informed law enforcement that an accident was not that it didn't appear to be an accident, and Todd's explanation didn't match up, he now becomes the only suspect. And as the agent said yesterday, we gather evidence that fits our theory. 
we gather evidence that points towards our suspect. Objection. Ms. characterizes the testimony. Go ahead, counsel. We heard from Deputy Hemsmith. I, I hope I say that's wrong, and I'm not trying to butcher it. Um, he came in, and we, he was talking about what he did, search warrants, uh, uh, interviews, and when we talked about the iPad, he told you, those are all done by Todd. I said, you sure? All done by Todd. Well, we know that's not true anymore. Unless Todd's on the internet looking for wedding dresses and diamond rings and uh, tattoos that we know that Amy was planning on getting. All of them, according to him, they have to be. And when I ask him about diamond rings and wedding dresses, he says, well, he must have been looking for them. So that's... Objection. This characterizes the testimony. The physical evidence, the CSI type stuff, there's not much here, hardly any. The rake handle, I, I agree with the state. Wooden handle, and even if it had fingerprints on it, it's going to have Todd's on it because he pulled it out of his wife's back. Understandable. The pathology done by Dr. Cruz, clearly a murder. No other physical or scientific evidence. But, but wait a second. The state brought out that Dr. Cruz clipped her fingernails and put them in a bag. But they were never examined. Never examined even though Dr. Cruz said that she suffered from defensive injuries to her hands. She had injuries to the front, to the jaw that someone attacked her from the front. And if you're batting off attacks, your hands are out, your fingers are out, your fingernails are out. But that wasn't examined, that wasn't followed up on by the state, because it didn't fit their theory. I believe the agent, I'll try to be accurate, says uh, it's scientific tests like that it's not driven by the facts of the case. That's what he said, not driven by the facts of the case. Well, if, if someone's suffering defensive wounds and batting off their attacker, isn't that driving this thing? Wouldn't that drive an investigation into those fingernails to see if someone's DNA is there? Someone other than Todd Mullis's? I would argue that it would appear that if if it's going to undermine the theory of the case, just don't do it. Only one suspect. I, I also believe, and, and again, I'll try to be accurate, that the, the photographs of her hands is that there was no damage done to her nails. Well, if you've ever worked on a car or worked in the garden, do you ever, can you get dirt under your fingernails or grease under your fingernails without injuring them? They took lots of photographs, apparently, of Todd's body, face, hands, back, feet, all of it. Any injuries? None. I believe, I don't know if it was the DCI agent or the deputy that in ruling out Frazier as a suspect in this case, they did a self-tower self search in his area of his home near Anamosa. No cell phone tower search around the Mullis farm. If, if someone, the murderer, was using a phone, had one, might have showed up on the cell phone tower. I have a page of all the witnesses, Deb, Deborah Shearbring, Jeff Fuller, Eileen Fuller, Angie Burr, Terry Stanner, the Emmys, uh, Thompson and Cruz, uh, Patricia Christofferson, 
Um, they told you about things that Amy said, things that they heard her say uh, when they were around her. Like Patricia Christopherson was very much aware that Amy was having an affair. Um, she was listening to Amy. Her knowledge of Todd, I think she admitted, was down to two instances. Uh, I think maybe they were both at funerals, or anyway, very, very minimal. Um, Jerry Frazier, sure, it was a wonderful day in court for him. Um, he, he said Todd called about these text messages, concerned about the professional nature of the contacts between him and Amy. He said he gave him an explanation and he thought Todd accepted it. And the relationship with Todd continued to be as normal as could be. All the way up until the time of the murder, even though he and Amy continued to have their affair. Frazier may have a different idea, and I think maybe some of the text messages and comments that Amy made to her friends start to show that even she started to realize that this was not going to be hap happily ever after with Jerry Frazier, that he was backing away, and that she was telling friends, I need to do this for myself. Eileen Fuller talked about a conversation about Todd saying that I believe that's when he said, I'm not going to lose my farm uh, two to three years after the first affair. So that would that make it a couple of years ago, approximately. Um, so is that evidence that Todd was planning and plotting the murder on November 10th, 2018? Quite a distance. Um, the deputies, you heard from them, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and again, I would state to you that Amy's comments to her friends about trying to make Todd out to be a bad guy was an excuse for her unfaithful conduct, wanting to, to keep the friends knowing that some of those friends like Todd. hard-working, good father, strong family man. Amy was just not satisfied. And again, after four to five years of what Todd perceived as being a normal, healthy family relationship, he, he's not, other than this little hiccup with, with Frazier and the text messages, which he follows up on and he's satisfied with the explanation, uh, what he doesn't know is that Terry Stainer goes to a medical conference and there's someone there that she hears uh, apparently that there's rumors that Amy's up to it again. So Terry goes back and tells Amy, that's the day that generated that crazy phone call to Deborah Sher Sherbring, who didn't understand what in the world other than she worked at the hospital and Amy was worried about rumors. Amy probably does the right thing. She talks to, Jer or to Todd. Todd says, okay, satisfied, and they go on. And then, then we go into that period where Amy's gone a lot. And maybe that had nothing to do with Jerry. We, we don't know for sure that there wasn't contact, but the, the health issues in the family. So September and October, other than her being gone, bad weather, farming, and Todd taking care of the family, that's what's going on up until November 10th. And that also in that four to five years of life, they, they changed their life to the, in a positive way. They put in another barn, they bought more land, they had plans, even plans in that timber that Amy was afraid Todd would bury her in, that's where they were gonna build a cabin to live in. And her interest in building a cabin there seemed to grow every time they visited it. The searches, all long before Amy's murder, if you look at the, at the exhibit, 
And, it, and now I, it seems that the state is conceding that Amy did some, we don't know how many, but at least some of the searches and she had access to that uh, Google account that had Todd's name on it. The ones that the state seems to find most, sig well, a significant one anyway, the body organs on November 6th. Todd told you, Taylor was concerned, wanted to know more information, and together they looked up this information. The state seems to be asking you to believe that Todd was specifically looking for the areas in the body where these organs are at so he could aim this fork when he was swinging it wildly and hit them. It, I, it just doesn't seem plausible. Um, at on, on NO, on the very left column, there's a number, and it goes all the way to that 2900 thing I told you about. On August 29th, right around the time that Stainer was telling Amy there's rumors, there's a search about bipolar disorder. Now, could Todd have done that? Could Todd be concerned about Amy's rather erratic behavior that she seemed to be showing at times, perhaps. The hunter safety, we talked about that. He said he searched for Frazier trying to get his wife's phone number, how to contact her. Uh, I had a whole list of the ones that I was gonna try to argue, prove that Amy was on this thing. The hairstyles for wedding dresses, jewelry. Uh, Todd talked about the swimming, floating, um, you know, was this a plan to drown his wife, or was this something that he's doing with his kids? The Ohana tattoo, beer bread recipes, uh, Domino's in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, the DNA thing we've talked about. their son was being pushed around, money taken away from him. Um, if you look at, uh, that was at entry number 2725, that numbering system. At 2726, there's a, there's a research of psychology today, a very legitimate psychological magazine. So if you, sometimes if you look around those searches, you'll see very legitimate connections to a real legitimate reason to be making those searches. Just a couple other witnesses. Uh, Michael Krogman, of course, talked about picking, taking Tristan back to the farm. Uh, told him to tell the truth, is what he said yesterday. Tristan seemed upset, rightfully so. Mike Mullis talked about the, again, although it doesn't appear necessary now, that other people had access to that iPad, but he also talked about the security cameras which Todd confirmed in his own testimony that if you knock the antennas out of the windows, there is no recording. And that's how they found them the day after Amy's murder. Common sense, the state says, is one of the tools that you have here today. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. Common sense. Is that man diabolical enough to not only murder his wife with that thing, 
but to send his 13-year-old kid to find her? Is, is that guy, did he do that? Does he present that type of horrible, horrible evil? You saw him. You, you, you get to judge him. Is there a reasonable doubt? Jury instruction number 10. I said at the end of my opening statement, there isn't just reasonable doubt. There's no doubt. Who did it? I don't know. I have no one to suggest other than what I talked to you about here before. The state's case is that used car with new tires and a paint job. They're asking you to take it and buy it, but don't test drive it. Don't start it up. Don't take it for a drive. Start the engine, do the test, and what you'll find is that the state has not proven a case against Todd Mullis beyond a reasonable doubt. And as I stated, The, the dots don't even remotely connect here. Do justice. Find this man not guilty.